my mind. I'm not faking this Easter Sunday. I can't just act like things are all good when things are not all good. I mean, look, I don't know about you, but I'm finding it hard to be happy in this season especially with everything that's going on around us. People have lost their jobs. They're struggling to figure out what next month might look like. We're battling for the lives of our loved ones. I'm finding it hard to be happy in this season. And I mean, how can you expect me to have hope when I found out not long ago that a friend of mine's parents, both parents died from COVID. Yeah, I'm not faking this Easter Sunday. And to be honest, I've been barely hanging on by a thread. With all of the chaos and confusion and loss of life and questions to God, I've held on by a thread. And that thread is this. That after everything, I'll stand. That after I feel like I've been through the worst of the worst and seen the worst, I'll just stand. I'll stand in faith and I'll stand in hope. And I have hope because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice to redeem the irredeemable. When he hung on that cross that we pierced his hands to, he looked up at his father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hope is not a fable. It was given freely by the one who sat at the last supper table. So if you ask me if I have hope this Easter, I'm not faking. He looked down from that cross 
And he said, it is finished. Not because death had won, but because life had just begun. We were finally free, free from the chains that held us captive. Our Savior had given us a happily ever after. I'm not faking this Easter Sunday. Hope was found with the linens he left behind to show us that we are not alone, that we are held by him, that hope is in his resurrection, that the fact is this is not the end, but merely the beginning. I'm not faking this Easter Sunday. Hope is found in the one who took my shame, your shame, our shame, and used it for our glory. Our hope is found in the one who turned the grave into a garden. I will stand and praise the one who can do that. And I'm not faking this Easter Sunday.
Good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. Welcome to Cyprus Online. We are so glad that we get to celebrate with you today. Whether you're watching on the website or on our Facebook page, go ahead and put in the comments where you're watching from and who you're watching with. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We are so glad you've chosen to check us out on Easter Sunday, and we trust that you're enjoying your experience so far. We would like to ask you to go ahead and do us a favor. Complete a digital connection card. This is going to allow us the opportunity to reach out to you, introduce ourselves, and get to know you just a little bit better. Also, when you complete that card, we're going to drop an, a, a gift in the mail to you just to say thanks for checking us out. You'll find a link to that connection card in the chat window right now. Well, students and parents of students in grades 6 to 12, we have an awesome opportunity for our youth students here at Cypress Meadows with our weekly meetups um, from 6 to 7.15 on Sunday nights, as well as our monthly events. This month's event will happen at Sky Zone on April 24th. To find out more information about that event and all things youth group, visit our website, cypressmeadows.org. Thanks, Tyler. On that website, you'll find there's ways to connect for every age and stage at Cypress. Adults, you have the cafe nights every week, the Habits of Jesus class every month and more. And, and kids, preschool and elementary school, kids and families, we have an incredible experience that our Kid Men team crafts every single weekend as part of our 11 o'clock service, as well as the uh, occasional events that we do. One coming up is our On the Lawn movie night for kids and families, April the 16th. You don't want to miss that. Hey, for more information about these events and more, you can visit our events page or you can just text the word events to 727-291-4491. Thanks, Brian. Now for our Metaverse who are tuned in with us today, giving is still super simple. You can give online, via text, mail, or simply drop your offerings and tithes off in person. Again, that's for Metaverse. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, your visit is a gift in and of itself. Hey, are you ready for a, a message that has an extra measure of hope this season? Well, here it is. Let's get ready to hear from Douglas. Well, happy Easter to you. What a beautiful day, beautiful day to be alive, and what a spectacularly beautiful occasion to be celebrating. The resurrection of Jesus. This day has come to mean everything to me. Everything to me. I mean, you take away Easter, you disprove the resurrection, and I feel like faith starts to fall like a house of cards. But with the resurrection, there is this foundation for our lives that is true and strong, and a foundation that can take us through some of the deepest, darkest valleys of life, help us to face cat five storms in life, but to be able to go through them with, with a hope that is strong and that is secure. The, the resurrection has just come to mean everything to me. Now, there was a time when I found myself just questioning the veracity, the validity of the resurrection, not only the resurrection, but many things of my faith. Because I made this discovery in my late teens, early 20s, that there were many things I believed that I believed them because people that I believed in believed them. And so I thought, I've got to figure this out for myself, what I believe in and why I believe in these things. And so I began this journey of just investigating the resurrection. And I remember reading a guy who, uh, who said loud and clear, you know, when people die, they die. People don't come back from the dead. This is nothing more than a fable and, and a myth. And so he proposed this hypothesis that what happened on that first Easter is that the disciples of Jesus went to the tomb and uh, overpowered this elite squad of Roman soldiers who were there, uh, were grave robbers, took the body of Jesus, went out and buried it secretly in some place, then went around town saying that, that he'd risen from the dead. And when I heard this, I thought, well, this just sounds ridiculous. Because these, these followers of Jesus, these disciples, they were anything but brave and bold and fighting men. They were fishermen. And so I thought about, really, the guys who, when the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they ran off in the dark like roaches run off when you turn the lights on. I thought all of a sudden they got brave and overpowered an elite Roman squad. I mean, this sounds to me like, like it would be like the Three Stooges and Jim Carrey taking on uh, a, a Navy SEAL Team 6 and overpowering them. It, that's, it's not going to happen. And then I remember reading about there were 400, 400 eyewitnesses to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. 
And after he rose, they began going around Jerusalem, telling him, he's alive, he rose again. And the authorities came to them and told them to knock it off, to shut up. And, and they wouldn't shut up. They just kept broadcasting everywhere they could through the streets. He's risen, you can put your faith in him. So they took, they took these people, uh, threw some in prison, confiscated their homes, their, their property, their businesses, um, took many of them, whipped them, beat them, uh, even threw them into arenas with wild beasts. And what I found interesting and fascinating is not a single one of them, not one, d- denied that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. It was undeniable for them. They couldn't deny what their eyes saw. And I got to thinking about that. I mean, they were convinced, right? And so I just want you to know that if any of you get some kind of a wild idea that you want to start some kind of a new religion, so you go over to uh, Sylvan Abbey Cemetery, do a little grave robbing, take a body uh, out of his grave, and then go hide it somewhere and bury it, and then go around saying, they rose from the dead. Put your faith in this person and give your money to me. If, if you concoct a plan like that, and I want you to know, just so you know, if the authorities come to my door and they threaten me or my family with this fabric, you know, this thing we're fabricating, I want you to know, I will sing like a canary. I will rat you out faster than, than an auctioneer can talk. Because it's, it's a myth, and I'm not going to suffer for something that is, not, that is simply not true. But what is fascinating is that all 400 of these people, it, it was undeniable for them. And when I read this, I thought, oh, and it has become undeniable for me too. This foundation for my faith is so strong and so secure. So today, it's a celebration, a celebration that love wins that life has defeated death. And so what a beautiful, beautiful hope we have. What a beautiful, beautiful day this is. And so let's just pause right now and then we're, we'll pray and then we'll, we'll go forward with this. So let, let's pray together, all right? Uh, Father, thank you for this day and all that it represents and all that it means. But we just want to stop in this moment right now. Wherever we are, just as we are. And Lord, express to you that there is this desire that is alive and it is true, deep in our souls, this desire that to meet you, to hear from you in this moment. And so, Father, would you find a way, wherever we are, to speak into our souls in this moment? And would you speak the words that we need to hear? And Lord, would you do it in such a way that it's undeniable to us that we've heard from you. We've heard your voice, because that's the voice that leads to life. And we pray this in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. um, I'm a a reader, an avid reader, and so is my little sister. Uh, I think we both got the reading gene from, from, from our mother, who's an avid reader. But my sister and I, we read books entirely different from each other. When she gets a novel or a mystery, the first thing she does goes to the back of the book and reads the last chapter first. But not me. I read books the way you're supposed to read them, the way God intended for us to read books. I go to chapter one and I make my way through it. Now, my sister goes to the last chapter because she wants to know how does the story end so that as she's making her way through chapter by chapter, if it gets a little sketchy for somebody or something gets really uncertain, it's like, well, it's okay because, you know, I know how it ends, but not me. I like the mystery. I like the twist and the the turns of a story, and I don't have to know necessarily how it it ends. Um, So I guess guess you can pray for my sister. So anyway, last year, it was about this time as we were entering into the thralls of this pandemic. And everything seemed remarkably uncertain for us. There was uh, sheltering in place, isolation, separation from people. Uh, We were still beginning to learn and discover how this virus gets transmitted from one person to the next and still discovering things about its impact on people because some folks uh, were asymptomatic. Other folks found themselves in a hospital in a respirator and, and even worse. And so there was tremendous uncertainty. And it was about this time last year that more than a handful of people came to me and said, Douglas, I am really struggling with anxiety in this moment. And if there was some way, somehow, if I just knew how this thing ended, 
I, I wouldn't be so worried. If I just knew that when everything is said and done that I'm all right, I, I'd have hope. I, I wouldn't be so anxious. And I got to thinking about how, how powerful, how, how strong hope is in a life. That, that if you take hope out of someone, you, you, you take courage and you take strength and you, you, take, you take the will to go on out of a person. Because, well, I mean, after all, if, if there is no hope, why should I even try? But if you can infuse hope into somebody's soul, you're infusing strength and you're infusing courage and you're infusing this, this whole will to go on because we know that in the end, no matter what happens, in the end, we, we prevail in this moment. People with a firm grip on hope are people who seem to be um, irrepressibly re resilient. No matter what comes their way in life, because when we have hope, we find a way to persevere. We find a way to fight. We, we find a way to, to face the next day. And the resurrection of Jesus is a reason to have hope. So there is a moment, uh, and we're going to go to this moment, a moment in the lives of the disciples of Jesus where it feels like absolutely, totally, and completely all hope is lost for them. And it's a really, really dark moment. So. Uh, during the time that the disciples were with Jesus, uh, there were just a few occasions where Jesus kind of gave him a heads up and he said, the authorities are going to kill me, but I'm going to overcome death. And uh, the, the disciples listened and heard this sort of like teenagers listen and hear the, the, their parents. Um, you've heard this with, with teenagers. If you have them, I've raised four of them, I had many more in my, in my home. But anyway, a parent talks to a teenager, they got their earbuds in and they're and they're 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 jamming. And the parents look at the kid and says, Did you hear me? And they they take out their little earbud and said, uh, yeah, yeah, right, whatever. And they go back, they go back to their jams. And you realize they didn't listen, they didn't really hear. And that's kind of how the disciples were in this moment when Jesus was telling them what was going to happen in the future. Everything was going so good and so wonderful. But there's no possibility that anything like that could ever happen. So it was like, yeah, yeah, Jesus, whatever. I mean, too many wonderful things happen. People are being healed. Too many people are coming uh, to get to understand who God is. So shortly before his death, in the moments before his death, Jesus sits down with his disciples one more time. And this time, like, he's going to read them the last chapter. And so in essence, what he's saying to them, whatever happens in the next few hours and the next two or three days here, I, I want you to know how the story ends. And it ends beautifully, and it ends with hope. And so Jesus says these words to his disciples. They're recorded for us by um, one of Jesus' closest friends, John. And John says, Jesus said these words, John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And he says this because what they're going to experience in the next few hours and days is going to be remarkably troubling. So he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Got it? <laughs> I'm going away, Jesus says. Remember, I told you, like, they're going to kill me. But he says, but don't get overwhelmed with worry and doubts and fears in this moment because I'm coming back. I'm going to overcome. The story ends in a beautiful way. So you can have help in these moments and hope in these moments when everything seems to be going awry and falling apart. And they listen like teenagers. And then the story begins to unfold. Jesus is arrested. And when he's arrested, the disciples flee into the night. They take Jesus. And he's, he's beaten. His back is laid open with a whip. They, they take nails and pound it into a cross. And he's hung up to die. This horrible death of a crucifixion. He, he dies. And then, they, and then they bury him in this moment. And the disciples, as this unfolds, are consumed with fear, consumed with this doubt and uncertainty. And 
convinced one they're going to be next and convinced all their hope they'd placed in Jesus had been misplaced. And so they go hole up in a safe house and the lights are low and the doors are locked, forgetting everything Jesus had just said about the last chapter, how the story ends. Have you ever been there? In a room, the lights are low and it is remarkably dark and everything seems foreboding. It's this place where you feel like, like all hope is lost and there is only this, this inescapable tragedy that awaits you. And it is, it, it is a dark moment of, of like deep despair. And you're convinced it's bad. And it's always going to be this bad and, and, and probably only even worse going into my future. And it's like, like you cannot begin to imagine a future without pain and without tragedy. And you, you have this sense, like there is no normal that awaits you on the, on the other side of this experience that you are, are facing in this moment. Only tragedy awaits you. And it's almost like no tomorrow could ever or will ever be better than today, and today is horrible. And you lose hope. And it's this dark, dark night of the soul where you, you feel like you come to the absolute end of yourself. And we feel like there's no future. And when we feel like there's no future, hope. There is no hope. And we think life is always going to be like this. So that's exactly where the disciples were in this moment. And then somehow, some way, some beautiful way, Jesus steps into the room with them. And when Jesus enters the room, hope enters into their spirits all over again. And all of a sudden they remember, oh yeah, yeah, this is how the story ends. This is what Jesus said to us. And I think that's why Jesus said these words. He begins by saying, you've got to trust in God and trust in me. I mean, because I've discovered when, when I trust in the circumstances or I trust in what I have, it doesn't seem adequate for what I'm facing. When, when I trust in who I am and, and what I have available to me, it seems like, but there is, is no way that this could take me through this that I'm facing in this moment. But when you trust in a person, when you trust in Jesus, your hope can stay resilient because you're not trusting in, in what I know or what I have. You're trusting in a who. And when you trust in a who, the right who, it, it brings hope to you. Um, I remember the day uh, remarkably well. <laughs> I remember a day that, that a, a man had me cornered. And he wasn't just angry. He was vehemently irate. And he was screaming in my face and spittle was like flying into my face. And I, oh, I hate those moments. And he was angry as can be. And he was, he informed me, he's going to bring down Cyprus. And he's going to bring down Cyprus by bringing down me. And he's going to bring me down. He was going to sue me into oblivion. And when he said those words, I thought, oh my goodness. I mean, I don't have much to begin with. I live pretty close to oblivion, so it won't take much to, to sue me into oblivion. And as I walked away from that encounter, there was this like this almost foreboding sense of impending doom. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what if we lose our house? Oh my goodness. What about my kids and their education? Oh my goodness. What about Cyprus and all the lives that are touched with it? And I just began, this dread began to fill me as I was thinking about the events that were going to be unfolding before me. And it was like a day or two later uh, that uh, I ran into a friend, good friend for a number of years. And uh, I was telling him about my encounter with the man who was um, putting spittle on my face and told me he's going to sue me into oblivion. And when I told him that, my, my friend looked at me and he smiled. I thought, why are you smiling? And he said, Douglas, Tell him to bring it on. Now, you need to know my friend. Um, he's a remarkably bright, brilliant guy who owns a, a company that uh, has, is known internationally, and he has really deep pockets. And he said to me, listen, people threaten me like this all the time. He said, trust me on this, okay? Tell him, 
to bring it on. I've got a stable full of attorneys, the best in the state. And he said, trust me on this. I'll take care of it for you. So in that moment, I don't know what he was going to do. I don't know how he was going to do it. I don't know when he was going to do it. I just knew that I could really trust this guy. And when the realization came to me that I can really trust this guy, he's got my back as he promised, all of a sudden, hope began to enter into my spirit. There's going to be a way through this. I'm going to get on the other side of it. I, I, I just I don't know what, when, how. I just know who. And I, this guy, he tells me the story's going to be all right in the end. So I'm going to trust him in this. And then I begin to have some confidence. And um, apparently one of his uh, pit bull attorneys in his stable uh, fired off the letter and everything went away. <laughs> now, there is this moment where a disciple of Jesus, a disciple who saw Jesus raised from the dead, a disciple who said, you know, I know the end of the story, looks back on his life and he talks about this, this principle we're talking about. And he's, he's up in years. And he's lived this long life. And so he's seen how things play out in life. He's been through hard times and got through them. He's been through some remarkable trials and unthinkable kind of challenges. But some way, somehow, God always got him through it to the other side. And so he says these words. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, I've come to discover that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So I've come to realize, I've lived long enough, that no matter what comes our way, in the last chapter, it's good. It's good. God brings good. So he says, no matter what happens, in all things, in lawsuits, in illnesses, and in pandemics, God goes to work for those who love him. And not only does God go to work, but at the end of the day, God gives us the grace we need to get through it. But no matter what happens, even if it's death itself, even if it's death itself, he says, we get through it. We get through it. And in the last chapter, we're okay. God brings good. The end of the story is that God goes to work in this and God brings good. So what he's saying to us is this. If you have a connection to God, then you also have a connection to the future. And if you have a future, then you always have a hope that is before you. And in the strangest of ways, I've come to discover, as long as you believe that you have a beautiful future, you can overcome the darkest moments that you go through. You see, Scripture says this. God's got a plan for you. And God's plan for you is to give you a hope and a a future. So God's plan is not that your every tomorrow is going to be Groundhog Day, and it's just going to be a repeat of the past over and over and over again. You, you don't need to know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when these things are going to happen. You only need to know the who that you are trusting to take you through and to the other side. And so Jesus said these words. So put your trust in me. And Easter is this day of hope for us because we have a future. And when you believe in the right who, there is this irrepressibly resilient hope that fills our lives. So if you've not done as Jesus said, if you've yet to put your trust in him, then give your life to him on this Easter. Like right now. Wherever you are, just pray, Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, I give my life to you. And he gives his life back to you. And it is a life of hope. So I want to end this day by, by singing a song together. It's a song of hope. Um, it's a song that says, I have a hope and I have a future. Because I've learned how to trust in God. And so, no matter what you're facing right now, no matter um, what is staring at you that seems threatening and foreboding in, of you and your life, robbing you of your future, and telling you that 
that it's bad and it's only going to get worse and uh, only and a tragedy you can't escape that is standing before you. Whatever is saying that to you, I want you to join in and sing this song. And sing this song. When you sing it, that you have a hope. It almost like you know you stare that in the eye and you put a chip on your shoulder and you straighten up your back and square your shoulders. And I've got a hope. I've got a hope and I've got a future. For Christ is giving me life and my life is in His hand. So, um, as Taylor and, and the house band sing this for us, I'm going to invite you wherever you are, just join in and sing along with us now in this moment, all right? I have a hope, I have a future, I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over, a new beginning's just begun. I have a hope, I have this hope. God has a plan, and it's not to harm me, but it's to prosper me and to hear me when I call the intercedes for me working all things for my good though trials may come I have this hope hey. I will yet praise Him my great Redeemer I will yet send up and give Him glory with my life it takes my to complete I have a hope I have this hope the goodness and mercy they're gonna follow me and I'll forever dwell in the house of my great king no eye has ever seen all these preparing there for me though trials may come I have this hope Will you praise Him, my great Redeemer? I will you stand up and give Him glory with my life? Take my darkness, oh, and it turns it into light. Will you praise Him, my Lord, my God? Hey. And there's still hope for. Cause the God of heaven loves me And there's still hope for me today Cause the God of heaven loves me Oh, and there's still hope for me today Cause the God of heaven loves me
Amen. Uh, we have a hope. We have a hope. We have a hope, don't we? <laughs> Death has been defeated. Life has been given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'm going to encourage you uh, over the next 21 days, go to the Cypress social media. Go to our Facebook page, Instagram. We're going to give 21 days of a message of hope. So we don't want you walking out of here and just forgetting this, but every day reminding yourself of the hope we have. So check in our social media for 21 days of hope. Happy Easter, everybody. He is risen. He is risen indeed.